Okay. Three, the two, one. First thing, <laughs> the first thing I'm going to have you do is I just want you to react to a screenshot. If I can find the screenshot <laughs> on my desktop. <laughs> uh, and I want you to uh, read, if you could, read aloud the second and third headlines. This is a screenshot of like a Google News type of thing. And I just put it in the chat. Read the second and third line. Second and third headlines. Um, okay, wait one second. Oops, chat. All right. Uh, which headline? Okay. Uh, the second and third. <laughs> Sailors are looking for new ways to ward off orc attacks and say blasting thrash metal <laughs> could be a game changer. <laughs> and we got from Huff Post. Ooh. Orcas pummel boat after crew tries to deter them with heavy metal music. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I will note that, like, if you read those two stories, uh, as I did, they uh, <laughs> they are basically both the same story. Like, the oh, first yeah. story admits that it failed, <laughs> but the headline was obviously, dude, this could Something be a game changer. <laughs> this could totally work. And then they admit to you in the article, it does, it does not work. <laughs> Dude, you, all these uh, Arca stories were so uh, right on time. I know, right? Like, that was one of the first things that I was thinking about. I was like, oh, the Orcas are attacking. There were, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think apparently, according to those articles, there were, like, the attacks are increasing. There are... 50 there were 55 attacks recorded attacks in 2020 and last year because we don't have complete numbers for 2023 but last year there were 207 oh shit <laughs> they're increasing they're learning oh, hell yeah workers um and i know that's a bit of a you know misnomer to start off because orcas are fake whales they're actually dolphins <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, when uh, the cytology stuff starts. Uh, fucking Ishmael kind of shits on all the other whales. And yeah. Uh, some aren't, aren't good enough. They're not whales. <laughs> um, and so that that was my my fun little... Uh, that That's what I was thinking about in my real world. Uh, apparently, like the... Apparently the uh, the popular theory going is that uh the the orcas see it as a, like they see it as play when they're bumping into these ships hmm. like it's just it's just fun for them but uh, right. uh but i like to imagine that there's something more sinister yeah that they've like dialogue and they're like organizing attacks and that we deserve it most of all oh yeah that too or, you know, the people in those boats deserve it. Anyone with a boat deserves to have their boat sunk. <laughs> it's wow. kind of an axiom, I think. Well, yeah. you know, an expensive boat. I, see. I mean, most boats that are around nowadays are expensive. Yeah. That's probably true. Uh, Fuck them. So Fuck solid, boats. We got planes now. Who need them? Solidarity with our orcas in arms. <laughs> oh, the orcas. <laughs> Yeah, somebody's got to uh, write a new book about orcas now. Oh, uh, they did. It's called Free Willy. <laughs> Wasn't that a book? I don't know. I don't know. It was a movie, but. <laughs> <laughs> ship my boys for Greenland she is bound and the key it is all garnish it with bonnie lassies around the captain gives the order to sail the ocean wide where the sun it never sets my lads nor darkness dims the tide so cheer up my lads let your hearts never fail while the bonnie ship the diamond goes fishing for the whale Oh, uh, okay. Now let's get into the actual uh, uh, book discussion. Talk about some real whales. Yeah, uh, Luke, <laughs> welcome again to our uh, second, uh, at this point, it's an annual podcast. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> the Books You Haven't Read podcast, where uh, we uh, we don't try too hard, I think is the tagline. Theme song. <laughs> bum, bum, ba, da, 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 da. 
I think I'm gonna actually put like a sea shanty in as the, hey, <laughs> as the oh, opening music. Uh, something about the Tillerman. Something. You're thinking about the Wellerman. Oh, Wellerman. <laughs> Uh, there once was a ship named Billy of the Sea. No, no, I'm gonna play Bonnie Ship the Diamonds because it's about whaling. <laughs> um, okay, so let, so yes, welcome to what you haven't read podcast, the only podcast where uh, we um, don't care too much, but also we do love the listeners. Thank you, listeners, and we're Thanks. the only one. The only uh, one. Yep. <laughs> uh, and by listeners, of course, I mean viewers, because this is YouTube exclusive here. Oh, yes. And they're going to be looking at what image? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe the, the... Well, no, I can't use the Discord image. That's for a different video. Did you like my Discord channel image? Yeah, I do. I, I couldn't quite tell what it was. But... It's some AI oh, art cool. for... Uh, <laughs> That I tried to get the AI oh, nice. to make for, uh, like, if one of the books that I read was a rap album mixtape. <laughs> That's pretty. So that'll be a little teaser for anyone listening. Um, okay, Luke, uh, what book did we read? We read Moby Dick or The Whale by uh, Herman Miller. His name is Herman. Herman Miller? Herman? It's not by Herman Miller, Luke. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Herman Melville. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, come on. It's a way worse name than Miller. Tiller. Herman, I got, Herman I got the Tiller Melville? stuck in my head, dude. I'm thinking about Tillers. I read I read that part where uh you're, where you're thinking of Henry Miller about... for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh first off. Herman, terrible name. Melville, terrible name. Herman Melville, kind of an epic. Awful. Well, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see it. Together they make it a little cooler. In, in, in who chose this book? Um, I don't know. I think fate, because that's what it felt like. I think technically I chose it in the context of our yeah. conversations. But, uh... I feel like the way that it fell into my lap and the time that it did is like most well, of the books I read was like, oh, it was, how did it? How did it, how did it fall and into your lap? Had you like stories. gotten a copy of it recently? Had you been thinking well, about it? Yeah. So like I, for years, like my entire life, I'm 30 years old. I have heard of Melville and uh, heard of this book. Obviously, we all know um, about Moby Dick, probably. Um, and and I have been it's been slandered for me like so many times in my life. I've heard people be like, oh, the big, long, boring book about whales and like it's too masculine. It's like boring. It reads like a, a shit manifest and <laughs> and like all this shit. Just people kind of uh, making it sound like a lame book. So I like never really even thought about trying to read it because it didn't seem worth it. It wasn't in enough fancy lit classes to. Uh, Can you remember like the first time that it that this book came on your radar? Like how early? Just the first time I actually cared about it, or like heard about it and cared about it, was in undergrad. It was like the weird fixation of like a whole uh, percentage of the lit. Uh, branch of our, okay. our English department like there were so many other students that were like obsessed with the book and and honestly they also turned me off of it because they were just like weirdly obsessed with it man <laughs> and I get it it's a real big book you can be in there for ages but uh but yeah there was like specifically like one girl that did her thesis on it and she was like really into it and uh and always talking about monomaniacs which i thought was funny <laughs> just like the word monomaniac at that point was like such a interesting word that grew interesting. on me um and then the other kid uh, other student max i want to say or you alex can lie and make up was like name. this poetry guy he would always go to uh, i don't yeah i don't even know if <laughs> i don't know <laughs> um, but uh he he would like bring it to poetry um nights and like just read passages out of it, but he had like such an intense, like poetic uh, voice 
and he would like scream <laughs> it at everyone. <laughs> kind of like Father Mabel in the yeah. beginning of the book. Like he's fucking going crazy. He loved that book. I don't know what's up with him. Now. But then the first time I really like got interested in it was you recommended a podcast to me called The Relentless yes. Picnic. And the, f- the episode that you recommended to me had an excerpt from the chapter The Line, which just the language alone was like, fuck, oh, this is this is good writing. Holy shit, is the whole book like this? And so like uh, the language wasn't by itself enough to prompt me to read it right away. But but Maybe down the line, to it. Um, I finally did. Yeah. Yeah, and it is like that the whole way through. Every fucking chapter, every yeah, page is like it's, that. It's it's crazy. very uh, it, it's, it's like very baroque awesome. is what I would say. <laughs> yeah, it's very like one of my so I remember like early early on in my life. I don't like the image I have in my head was this was in my like third grade class, and our teacher brought out like a picture book version of Moby Dick. And, uh, yeah, and so. uh, she was like telling us this, you know, the story of Moby Dick. And um, I, maybe it was I went to private Christian schools nearly my whole life, like, you know, pre-college. So maybe it was in like the context hmm. of we were also studying Jonah. But I honestly have no idea. Because I know it oh, seems yeah. like just odd to me that like one day at story hmm. time. We were gonna do Moby Dick, a, a story that no eight year old. <laughs> and now, read, but uh, d- who knows? Schools, maybe they do something right. Um, <laughs> and so I remember, like, just I, I remember the call, the call me Ishmael line, and I remember, you know, like the the yeah, the that. whale like crashing into stoving the the ship. And I, you know, knew it was long. And I feel like I got enough of the gist of it at age like eight that I was like, eh, I don't need to read that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, the the humility of man or something. You crazy guy tries to kill a yeah. whale and doesn't work. <laughs> <Got> um, <laughs> and so what did you, I mean, you kind of touched on it. Did What did you maybe know about the book coming into the process. I similarly, I felt like I know everything, knew everything about it. Um, I, what I, I, I think like assumed was that it was like big, lofty language, dry. Um, and yeah, essentially a, a story about the hubris of man trying to, I don't know, uh, tackle, the nature okay. of God or something. Um, I don't think I thought about yeah, it more than that. I mean, it's always hard to, I think, especially with like classics, it's always hard to kind of have a concrete idea of what the book is, but there's always this feeling of like, nah, I got the gist, right? <laughs> or like somehow we fill in the gaps with our minds. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I know this. I, um, one of the books... <laughs> probably the most I ever thought about the book Moby Dick before this was when I read a book called, this is over 10 years ago now. It's called the art of fielding by Chad Harbach. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Um, it's mm-hmm. basically, no. it's, it's a campus novel. It's a college campus novel and it takes place in the context of like <laughs> a college baseball team. And one of the, uh, one of the students there, um, is like studying Moby Dick for his, you know, thesis. So there's lots of like, there's lots of like tying into like Moby Dick and also referencing Melville's real life, um, which I researched a bit in that dude's life is absolutely fascinating. And so like part of the, part of this novelization uh, was that uh, near the end of his life, Herman Melville uh, uh, came to this, you know, fictitious, uh, I think the schools in Michigan or something, but somewhere up there in the Great Lakes um, and like taught a course. And so that was like the tie in. Well, one of the other things that I wanted to ask was like, how did this uh, how did this meet you in your personal life or maybe another way? Like what resonates in the book 
with you now that like maybe resonates thematically within your own life? Right. Well, I think like the first thing that struck me about the book, like that broke all of my previous impressions of it, even the excerpt that I'd heard, the the line excerpt, which is like, uh, it was like cool language, very deep, so much weird. Like he's, he's just like uh, every other uh, paragraph, Ishmael will like go off onto some rant about like the the whole cosmos <laughs> and every man and oh my god it's it's so big but the thing that really got me was like when i started actually reading out it was like this is a fucking hilarious book like i could not stop laughing and like there's so many stupid scenes in it that like oh, i just wish we're like i don't know they could be done like some kind of sitcom almost like some office level sitcom where everybody's dying <laughs> but like <laughs> It's 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 so funny. I think that was the main thing that like uh, was astounding to me as somebody who had heard this book so many times and nobody had yeah. ever told me it was funny. Like, how did that escape? The, yeah, I equation? think yeah, and um, that's one of the so, things but, like, I think that you know that baroque language, um, you know, maybe like masks or just like it, there's there's a little bit of a. Uh, higher level of difficulty to like access that humor oh definitely like there's some things that i didn't uh, I sailed over my head completely like i went back and looked into one of the quotes early on and it was like i was just like looking up a word that i didn't know oh it was like the pythagorean theorem of something and, and i was like what the fuck does this have to kind of i'll just like read the a squared plus b squared funny. come on but uh <laughs> Well, no, but right. that so that's what I but thought, and I was else. like, oh, okay, so this is like, I thought, yeah, I thought it was like something about how you have to like tack your ship in order to, I don't know, catch the wind better, and and it turns out it's a fucking <laughs> fart joke, dude. I, I swear to God, when I looked it up, the internet was like unanimously said this is a <laughs> convoluted fart joke. Yeah, is it? And it's like. <laughs> Stuff like that it is like so weird and hilarious. Yeah. But... Well, it's, it's when he's talking about um, how the the sailor at the prow, like the working man sailor, catches the fresh air off the sea, and the captain way back in the cabin yeah, catches yeah, yeah. the farts of old as in, <laughs> as in this world, headwinds are far more prevalent <laughs> than winds from it's, the stern. Uh, There's so much silly stuff. That in is... It's fun. But uh, in terms of like my personal life, like, uh, yeah, I mean, it just like, it's amazing to me that this book was written so long ago because it's like, it's today. Like, I, <laughs> I don't understand. It's, I, I feel like moments from it, I'm like reading about the world I live in. And it's like, it's essentially a giant foreshadowing of the world we live in. It's saying like, these are all the moving pieces that, that are bringing us to the place that we're now in and we're always in maybe but um but i think that to me was the most interesting thing is i like i've just been going in and out of jobs i feel like i feel like uh the all the books i've read recently have uh have been about jobs and about <laughs> how much they suck or like are unfathomably interesting <laughs> they're unfathomably fathomably it's, interesting it's, i don't know it's kind of wild you said you said unfathomably interesting uh so so for a little bit i worked at a mortuary and uh apart from that being like a crazy job to work and seeing a lot of weird shit also feeling the same thoughts i think that go through someone like melville's head when he's embarking on a whaling ship as a, like a fucking schoolmaster <laughs> like i'm not really meant for this world uh of of lugging around dead bodies but like watching how that operation worked how the other people there interacted with each other and seeing the the all the crazy <laughs> whale lines attached to the to them through that company and that industry like it's impossible there's like so much you could explore in there and that's something that's like 
a growing presence in all of America. It's like this SCI corporation that's mm-hmm. handling all your dead. That's that's <laughs> right. a real thing that's happening. <laughs> It's buying up all the all the little mom and pop oh shop funeral homes and and turning it all into McDonald's <laughs> the McDonaldsification <laughs> of uh, of mortuaries and like that shit is crazy. There's so many <laughs> true. It's so true. Or is it the Starbucksification? <laughs> hey. And uh, it's crazy. There's so many parts of the world that are like that, and you don't always yeah. see them. At Peterhead, the lassies stand around with their shawls about their heads and salt tears running down. I'll never weep, my bonny lad, though I'm left behind. For there's not a rose in Greenland's ice to make you change your mind. So cheer up, my lads, let your hearts never fail. While the bonny ship, the diamond, goes fishing for the whale. Since we're getting into the, uh, uh, I don't know, kind of the capitalist, uh, the, the, the talk about work and labor and capitalism that I think we're both interested in. Um, yeah, for sure. One of the things that I found really fascinating, because I um, came across like a bunch of different like biographical, but also just historical stuff about kind of the time and place this uh, was written in. And one of the things I found fascinating was that whaling was the fifth largest sector of the economy when this book was written. And then by the end of the century, by the end of the 19th century, 19th, yes, 19th century, it was like virtually gone from America. Yeah, it disappeared really fast. Yeah. And apparently, like, uh, apparently according to what I read, half-assed internet research, so take this with however many grains of salt you want. Um, the, <laughs> the like common myth is that, like, oh, um, you know, basically we got all our needs from, like, from, like, actual oil, like, stuff coming out of the ground, and we just transferred to that. Um, but apparently, like, whaling went on right. like, really strong in several other companies, or in se- several other countries, rather, Um uh, throughout the world until like the middle of the 20th century. And the, I think they said like there were 1.1 million sperm whales. They estimated like at the beginning of the 1800s and there's like 300,000 left today. (laughs) So, so, uh, uh, job done job. Well done. And apparently the, uh, the reason that like America gave up on it is because, (laughs) They're still there. <laughs> yeah, I. You know what? We didn't completely eliminate them. Uh, and and apparently the uh, uh, the reason was because like the Americans, uh, the American whalers cost too much money. It was cheaper to employ like Norwegians and Russians, and I think even Brits. Oh shit! Yeah. Um, well, like even in the even in the book, he says like most of the men actually doing the most of the work are from all the, right. all the islands. It's a bunch of blacks and, and yeah, yeah, Pacific yeah. Islanders, including our our dear and... Queequeg. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, like well, aren't aren't all of the actual like harpooners? They're all like yeah. So like the more yeah, dangerous it all... is. Uh, the more the more you you have the non whites do that, and it's like pretty much the same. Like that's how all of this has worked. Is like we slowly outsource all the shit tasks to other people, and they do yeah them out of sight and out of mind. What did you think of like? What did you think of of Queequeg, First of all, uh, I I love Queequeg. Queequeg is great. He's uh okay. he was the best part of the book for me. Uh especially a book that like needed for me needed a hero and finally oh look Queequeg. I mean he was there the whole time. That was the other thing that I wasn't I was kind of surprised by like nobody really talks about or that I heard nobody talked that much about Queequeg when they told me about okay. Moby Dick. And like he's there from like the what he, second yeah, chapter very early on. They're sleeping together Third by chapter. like the seventh or eighth chapter. They get into bed real quick. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I love that too. They're like, it's so like, it's like, it's like homoerotic. It's, uh, it's, it's, I don't know. It doesn't even like try to like hide it. It seems like very explicit about like, it like calls them like, a, yeah, a right. He's making set, like, like he's making gay like, jokes. Talks about that. <laughs> he's like, like, yeah, times. it's like, a, it's like a mid aughts comedy where they're like, uh, you know, All just like trying to be like, haha, you know, I know you're gay because uh, we listen to Coldplay. <laughs> um, one of the things that I thought uh, was interesting about Queequeg is that he is like Ishmael tells us he is like, uh, he, he's basically a prince from wherever he comes. And he is like here, like he so desperately wants to get to America right. that he's like, I will take the shittiest, hardest, most dangerous job that you can give me. And he also does it in the craziest way. He just, like, uh, like canoes up to a, a, a boat that's, like, going by his island. Right. And just, like, sneaks on board. He's just like, hey, I'm gonna, like, you can't get rid yeah. of me. Which give is me a very, job. So, do you know much <laughs> about, um, like, Melville's early work? His early writings? So, the only other thing I've read is Bartleby. The Scrivener. Okay. Which yeah. I also love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that is also the only other thing that I've read. But one of the, you know, like things I've read about or uh, watched video lectures or documentaries about was his first, uh, his first sort of novel was kind of, it's kind of a novel. It was kind of a memoir. Um, and it was a, it was called Type E. And it was about uh, his like adventures to, like a South Pacific Island. I don't know if it was like Tahiti, but it was like, you know, uh, one of the South Pacific islands where he kind of met, uh, what one of the peoples was called Taipei. Um, or at least that was the language I think that they spoke. And, um, I think in one of the like things that he was really interested in was the sort of civilization versus savage, uh, kind of, you know, conversation. We'll put savage in quotation marks here. Um, right. But that, uh, uh, according to like his writing, he basically said like nothing was like prohibited, especially sexually, especially, you know, between like sex between uh, like genders or like sexual or yeah, like genders. Um, and that like his little caretaker, I don't think Melville ever. Uh, admits to being gay or says that he is, but his like kind of caretaker when he was with these people was himself like uh, very like uninhibited and uh, uh, he was a gay man. And so um, I wonder if like, I, I you tell me what you kind of thought um, cause you were kind of touching on it, but I, I wondered if like a lot of the the homoeroticism was kind of um like it was obliquely hinted at but like you know melville didn't want to necessarily write that stuff down is there is there actual like homosexuality being hinted at but just not like explicitly being written in i i i think it's like twofold like i think i think in part it's that like i don't think he's trying to hide the fact that like I, I think he's very brazenly trying to show, like, oh, this is the kind of relationships we form just by the nature of being yeah. on a ship with a bunch of dudes. I'm sure stuff like that happens all the time. I've heard about it in every connection with sailors I've, that I've heard of. Um, but, uh, but I think it's also like, you no, know, like he just like starts talking about that stuff so early on in the book. And and like you mentioned, like he's done this in previous novels. This is he's speaking to some experience that he's had of indigenous people. And I think he's trying to affront the the reader of that time and say, like, like, I don't know, like what the what is this? What is what is this relationship we have with each other? And and show the sweetness of it too. Like he doesn't yeah. talk about it as as uh debauched stuff he's talking about just like a friendly conversation almost or like a 
uh, a love that's uh, very, uh, it's like as much uh, a physical thing as it is like a, just like spending time with a person you care about. At, <laughs> I don't know, like one in the morning in bed, <laughs> smoking a pipe. I like I I don't know like I think he's he's trying to open in some way the the hearts of whatever world that he yeah I mean I time. I'm sort of asking this question to be you know provocative I feel like every you know like I feel like it's very common in university studies to kind of queerify whatever you're looking at um like you want to look at oh it yeah like, okay like what like especially stuff and like this the 19th century um where it, it it feels like there's almost more of a level of like repression around it um or institutional repression that we yeah. want to like kind of uncover and sort of uh bring to the fore like actual uh when is like homosexuality being hinted at but like on the other hand i think it's always this struggle of um are we trying to queerify what is just like uh uh i guess like male intimacy that uh itself you know kind of because we are trying to queerify it where we're we're taking out like the reality that like sometimes dudes just want to cuddle yeah i think i think that's a good point and i think it also like is what kind of uh he's talking about in some way like when he mentions um uh he like talks about the act that Cleef like does like he they get like back to the um the inn and they're like talking they start to become friends and then like it clicks in Queequeg and he's like all right I'm ready let's go where he like gets out his coin purse and like <laughs> throws down all his money and like gives <laughs> Ishmael half of it and <laughs> And there's just like a like a deep part of his culture that that has taught him that this is a thing that you do when you trust somebody yeah. in this way, and and like he's not he's not necessarily talking about the like in the in the realm. I mean, like the, I guess queerness as like a as a um, academic field study, uh, yeah, department venture. Yeah, field doesn't exist in that yeah. time in the same way, maybe. Um, but but I think what what he's showing is like in the engine and this experience he's had with all these indigenous people, like the, the, there's there's something at play here that was presumably at play in many cultures across the world before you know the birth of what is now Western civilization. There's like things at play that don't fit into our vocabulary and our culture. Yeah. That like nowadays we have names for and they don't really respond to that. Like the the need for intimacy in one's life is not something that started with our language as it is now or any part of our culture or society. Like that was primordial and happened a long time before we came up with all these definitions yeah and i it's interesting and the that definitions you, don't really serve it well and it's interesting that you bring up like um you know like certain languages uh don't work for us because in that um in like the scene in which they're going to bed together like uh one of the things that struck me was that mm. ishmael was like uh he he uses the lines i was a good christian born and bred in the bosom of the infallible presbyterian church um and he basically is like okay so like what's the right thing to do here <laughs> like uh should i or i guess they're they're praying to like Queequeg's uh little yeah he they're praying yeah, to yeah. yojo and he's like well i can't do this cuz i'm a good christian but what is a Christian if not, yeah. you know, essentially the golden rule? And yeah. am I am I going to treat this? Yeah, yeah, it so explains. He, it is, yeah, uh, so it he, is he fashions, you know, kind of his his old world into something practical and necessary for his moment, which I I hmm. think this book is full of, um, or or certainly it. Yeah, I I I love that too because I think. 
I think that Queequeg is kind of doing the same thing in the relationship. Like, they're both meeting in the middle of whatever beliefs they have. Job 38, verse 1 through 11, New American Standard Translation. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens the divine plan by words without knowledge? Now tighten the belt on your waist like a man, and I shall ask you, and you inform me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements, since you know? Or who stretched the measuring line over it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who enclosed the sea with doors when it went out from the womb bursting forth? When I made a cloud its garment in thick darkness its swaddling bands, and I placed boundaries on it, and set a bolt in doors, and I said, As far as this point you shall come, but no farther, and here your proud waves shall stop. Um, what did you think of the, uh, uh, of the father Mapple uh, sermon? God, that chapter, it does goes go so hard. hard. That was the first <laughs> chapter that I was like, okay, uh, now here we go. Uh, <laughs> that was another one where I was like, am I just making this funny in my head? Or like, like he starts off by like describing how father Mapple like arrives and has to like climb up the monkey rope to his, uh, podium, uh, uh, God, uh, what do you call it? Oh, um, his, uh, what do you call um, it? Lectern? Oh, uh, God, the word. Uh, the prow of the ship? Yeah, the, the prow of the ship. The pulpit. Pulpit, the pulpit. Um, that, that whole section is, is, is kind of comical, but then he's like, Ishmael's like, I don't think this guy's a hack, though. Like, the way he was, <laughs> he was pretty cool about it, the way he did it. Um, I don't think he's a hack, but like, the whole scene is just kind of, hacky like <laughs> just like yeah, way yeah, over yeah. the top sermon and he like starts by like calling every like starboard gangway there side of our uh, larboard larboard gangway to starboard yeah. midships midships it's <laughs> That's just mean, hilarious every, you know <laughs> i did want to go read ahead, the first. the pulpit line though okay yeah go ahead and read that uh uh <laughs> so uh what could be more full of meaning for the pulpit is ever this earth's foremost part. All the rest comes in its rear. The pulpit leads the world. From thence it is the storm of God's quick wrath is first descried, and the bow must bear the earliest brunt. From thence it is the god of breezes, fair or foul, is first invoked for favorable winds. Yes, the world's a ship on its passage out, and not a voyage complete, and the pulpit is in drown. Like that shit? Goddamn. Yeah. God it's, damn. Um, uh, speaking as someone who has spent a fair uh, amount of time in churches, right. um, there is like, yeah. Um, and I've been thinking about this just a lot more recently is how like the, uh, th- there is a necessary like theatricality to even like doing sermons like on a weekly basis. Like it really <laughs> is. Um, I don't know. There's like a theater kid impulse to it where like these people are not just there to give you like good moral lessons, but there is Mm -hmm. like a whole sort of, um, no, the, the intonations and the, the speechifyings of the way that, um, even still today, pastors and preachers kind of go about it is just always so dramatic. That's funny that even even in one of the chapters earlier, he passes like this black church and he like looks in and like is like scared and then he like walks out and he's like, What wretched entertainment? <laughs> it is. It's like partial entertainment. Um 
I okay. So for the sermon itself, like, how familiar are you with like the Book of Jonah? So this is one of my uh, my big problems with this book is I'm not that familiar with the Bible as a whole. Um, and most of this is talking a lot about uh, the Old Testament, which is the only part I've really read of that or any of the Bible is Genesis. And I think a little bit further, but pretty much that. I vaguely understand. A lot understand... of the greatest hits are in Genesis. Yeah. <laughs> There's like a lot of most good shit of, in Genesis. Yeah. A surprising um, amount of like, but, uh, Bible but yeah, stories are like in Genesis. But yeah, go ahead. Well, so yeah, I mean, obviously Melville is uh, deeply... <laughs> uh intertwined here with the bible there's so many biblical well, just, that i can't even yeah ishmael do you know who, okay name, do you know uh, who ishmael is i do now but i had to look it up i vaguely remember that because that is in the in genesis yeah, yeah. um so he's the the first son of abraham yep. who is split off because he's like the son of the maid because uh, abraham's wife couldn't have kids yeah um but then later she did. And then later she did. Isaac. Um, and then and then Ishmael and his mom were cast away, and I think they form the the Yep. They're Islamic they're said peoples. to uh yeah. So they God basically directly. came to Abraham and was like, I'm gonna make you a father of many nations. And you know, Abraham was like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh my wife's kind of old though. Like, you gonna do anything about that? Like she's past her years. And God's just like, dude, just trust. And so it gets, goes on for like, you know, a little while. And Abraham's like, I'm not, I'm not trusting God. Uh, Sarah, what are we going to do? She's like, oh, take my maid. He's like, done. Gets her pregnant. Then God's like, you idiot. That's not what I meant. Why didn't you just trust? Uh, and so he's like, okay, well, here's the deal. At the very <laughs> least, he'll be a nice guy. I'll make Ishmael the father in many nations too as well. And, uh, you know, obviously everything ended up um, really good after that. And there's been no strife between Muslims and Jews ever since. Uh, uh, I think, I, I don't know, like it, it, in some way to me, I didn't really understand why Ishmael in that sense compared so to Ishmael, the book, um, other Ishmael's than the fact that he's kind of, Ishmael is this like single part yeah. of this, yeah, exactly. He's like this uh, cut off part of the, <laughs> yeah, it's the like, story. It's... But that goes on to breed great nations. He's yeah. still here. His book exactly. exists. And, and we're talking about it. We are truly the Ishmaelites of the 21st century. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> <laughs> but back to Jonah. Uh, can you tell me more like uh, what you uh, what you know of the story? Um, I all, only knew that Jonah was the guy that got eaten by a whale yep. and then split up by a whale. That's, that's what he's famous for. Uh, do you know? <laughs> I didn't know why. Yeah, you, could you or pick what up meant, from the book, yeah. like, why he was, like, eaten by a whale? It's okay if it's no. Yeah, so he tried, I, I think, I think the, the way I read it was that he was scared, like, he felt the need to be as as mm -hmm. Father Ma Mapple, uh, the voice of God on Earth, of like some kind of uh, uh, priest yeah, about uh, voice of God. Um, yeah, prophet. And and he was like, Nah, fuck that, dude. I'm going halfway across the world, and God's not yeah. that big, so he ain't gonna follow me there. And doesn't work out. He gets yeah, eaten by a so whale. <laughs> and the, while he's in the whale has the coming to Jesus moment of being like, okay, I will voice, I will say your words. And, and then does, yeah, he does. He's different. basically, God tells him, uh, go to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian empire, uh, which is, you know, probably like conquered Israel at this point and yeah. go preach about me. And he's like, uh, no, that's scary. Uh, I'm going to go the opposite way. God sends, uh, it's actually called a great fish, and there's many a spilled ink over whether it was actually a whale or a fish that uh, Jonah was swallowed by. Uh, and then he gets uh, spit up, and then he goes to Nineveh, and he preaches the word, and he kind of hates it. <laughs> and uh, I think he maybe, I think he like maybe gets a couple... <laughs> Well, yeah, he's he like, hates it. like, Jonah is kind of a moody bitch, I will be honest. 
he like he's constantly saying he doesn't want to do what god <laughs> tells him to uh and then he like i'm pretty sure he leaves like nineveh early but at least he doesn't get killed like he assumed he would but then when he leaves uh he like finds nice. this tree and he really loves it um and then i'm pretty sure god like kills it at some point and okay. there there's it's a very short book and the <laughs> swallowing by the whale is only like one of the chapters um and it's kind of a and jonah's kind of a petulant child about having to do his job the entire time which uh makes <laughs> him funny. more human than <laughs> a lot of the other biblical characters um but uh okay and then the other uh, the other book I wanted to ask you about, because it's kind of referenced throughout this, is the book of Job. Do you know the story of Job much at all? So I, I know very little about the story of Job. I've I've heard allusions to it, but then I also watched that movie that you made me watch, the Coen Brothers movie. That's essentially oh, the story yeah, of Job. Yeah. Job's uh, the one that loses man. like everything. Yeah. Yeah, no, I like that. So <laughs> I know that story. and. and uh, I get the yeah, general the story is so <laughs> the reason I bring these two kind of books up is that they sort of form um kind of opposite moral views, so that like Father Mapple and Captain Ahab they kind of adhere to like um hmm. a more Jonah version of kind of God in nature and punishment, and Ishmael has a more kind of job like hmm. uh I don't know, like uh, understanding of the world. What I mean by that is like, so in Job, let me explain this first. Job is, uh, you know, righteous, upstanding man. And so Satan comes to God and he's like, I'll make you a wager. Uh, I'll bet you that that, you know, rich guy, Job, that loves you so much, he only loves you because he's rich and wants to take away all his things and worldly possessions and his family. Uh, He will not... uh, uh, be righteous and God's like okay fine but don't kill him hmm. <laughs> and so <laughs> and so Hold Satan you know like so there are you know huge calamities that fall upon Job he loses all his livestock loses all his children um, and uh, he gets like painful boils all over his skin that he has to scrape off with pottery shards Um. And then uh, basically the whole book. So that's like the kind of prologue. The first, I don't know, two or three chapters is like, it gives you the setup of, okay, here's the wager. Mm -hmm. Here's what happens. Uh, After each succeeding calamity, a servant comes to Job and says, and I alone have escaped to tell the tale, Um, which is obviously echoed throughout, throughout this (laughs) Uh, book. It's the, I believe the epigraph of the epilogue. Yeah. Final. Whoa. And um, yeah. and then like most of the book from chapters <laughs> like I don't know three or four or so to like forty forty one is like an epic poetry sort of mm. thing where three friends of Job's come over and they all engage in these philosophical discussions over okay what exactly has Job done wrong to deserve this and what should he do. And Job is constantly saying, like, I've done nothing wrong. I know I'm a good person. I, I <laughs> uh, like, God must have this wrong. And everyone's like, well, no, if bad things happen to you. Because, like, uh, in Jonah, you have, hmm. you know, the whale being sent. Like, God sends the whale to eat Jonah. And therefore, he uses nature to kind of exact justice or, or his sort of vision of justice right. on man. Right. Um. And then with Job, it's uh, the 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 other interesting thing about Job is that the composition of it is such that it appears to be like a pretty standard kind of Aesop's fable type of thing about uh, a guy getting all his worldly possessions taken from him and being steadfast and still um, being a righteous man even after everything has been taken away from him. And so, like, in the middle, it's kind of, like, split, and then there's this huge kind of epic poetry battle where these people are, you know, essentially, like, trying to have a discussion of why do bad things happen to us? Uh, Why do bad things happen to good people? Mm. Um, 
And you can, in some ways, like, imagine this as like a dialogue about why is Israel, like, we are faithful to God. Why is Israel always getting, like, overrun by surrounding empires and exiled? And well, what did we do to deserve this? Everyone goes around and, like, some people's opinions is like, uh, Job, you should, like, uh, repent for what you've done wrong. And Job's like, I'm not repenting for anything I've done wrong. I've done nothing wrong. And I'm standing firm by this. <laughs> and other people are like, well, clearly God's an asshole. So you have earned the right to like uh, curse God basically mm. and like blaspheme him. And he's like, well, no, I'm a righteous man. I'm not going to do that. Um, and so mm. the the story comes, it's a really, it, 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 it's a really like hard book to kind of reconcile with because of one, because the composition of it makes it that like, Obviously, there were some unresolved issues over sort of why bad things happen. And so they put in kind of this later poetry stuff in it that's like epic and kind of some of the best writing in the Bible. The moral worldview, basically at the end of the book, God comes down in a whirlwind and um, he has. Have you ever. So you're a Terrence Malick fan, right? Uh, more or less. Yeah. I like some. Uh, have you seen Tree of Life? Yes. Uh, okay, so the epigraph for that movie comes from Job, and um, okay. the 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 line in there is that uh, like, where were you uh, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Um, and God basically comes down like Job challenges God like, okay, why? What makes you kind of? What exactly is your system of right and wrong? Of what am I being? For what am I being punished? All this stuff. And God basically comes down and says, uh, you know, motherfucker, I made this whole thing. Um, I've made these beasts like uh, Behemoth and Leviathan. Leviathan was obviously a huge word in the book. Um, mm. And at least at the time of writing Moby Dick, Leviathan was understood to be commonly understood to be the whale. Now I guess it's understood to be like kind of like a crocodile or a dragon. Anyway. A large and terrifying beast, um, mm. nonetheless. And God comes mm. down and says, uh, 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 ob basically obliquely admits that uh, morality is not inherent in creation. That some things, these terrifying and uh, uh, awesome creatures exist that are of no use to man. And yet, you know, God has created this... <laughs> Um, vast and intricate uh, world of of creation, and um, anyway, by the end of the book, Job's like, "All right, this shit is pretty dope. I'm sorry, I repent uh, for like ever doubting you." <laughs> and then he gets like twice, and then he gets like twice the stuff back. Oh, nice! Hey, <laughs> baby, yeah, everything gets restored. Like the moral worldview that the that the book of Job is trying to express is one in which like those answers to justice are ultimately inscrutable and unclear. And so uh, questions of why mm. questions of evil and why bad things happen are unanswerable. Um, and in order to understand them, you would have to be kind of the creator himself, God himself. And so when we talk uh, about like kind of the Jonah versus Job view of things, like the Jonah view of things is, uh, you know, God uses nature, sends these vast creatures to, to uh, as punishments. They are at his whims. And in Job, it's like, yeah. uh, no, like morality isn't inherent in the creation of the universe. Well, I, I, I wonder then what, what to you does this whale exist for? Like, what is, what is this Moby Dick? thing that that is like the fascination of they have in the book because i th this is the part where where i i feel like there's so much bible and christianity or or old testament wrapped up in this book that i sometimes lose that connection um and just like you uh comparing ishmael to job that's a really fascinating take that I didn't well, get because I didn't. Let me. Uh, I don't yeah, read yeah. Job too much. Oh, that's what we'll read next. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I honestly do. I I think the Old Testament 
just based on this book, it seems to have a it's, lot of cool stuff in it. <laughs> Maybe not all of it. I want to read Solomon, at least. He, like, says Solomon's pretty cool. You want to read Songs of Solomon, or you want to read about Solomon? Because Songs of Solomon is, like, the sex book in the Bible. Uh, no. I'm saying that could be a fun, uh, uh, potentially homoerotic uh, activity for us to do. <laughs> um <laughs> No, okay, let me get to <laughs> let me get to uh this is from chapter forty two in Moby Dick. Uh this is called uh I'm gonna read kind of the last paragraph, but this chapter is called The Whiteness of the Whale. And this is like where we get Ishmael's kind of most direct thoughts on like what the whale kind of means. Um Right, right. Okay. So I'll try and Okay. I'm in the last paragraph for readers following along at home. Is it that by its indefiniteness, it shadows forth the heartless voids and immensities of the universe and thus stabs us from behind with the thought of annihilation when beholding the white depths of the Milky Way? Or is it that as an essence, whiteness is not so much a color as the visible absence of color and at the same time, the concrete of all colors? Is it for these reasons that there is such a dumb blankness, full of meaning in a wide landscape of snows, a colorless, all color of atheism from which we shrink? And when we consider that uh, that other theory of the natural philosophers, that all earthly hues, every stately or lovely emblazoning, the sweet tinges of sunset skies and woods, Yea, and the gilded velvets of butterflies, and the butterfly cheeks of young girls, all these are but subtle deceits, not actually inherent in substances, but only laid on from without, so that all deified nature absolutely paints, like the harlot, whose allurements cover nothing but the charnel house within. And when we proceed further and consider that the mystical cosmetic which produces every one of her hues, the great principle of light, forever remains white or colorless in itself, and if operating without medium upon matter, would touch all objects, even tulips and roses, with its own black tinge. Pondering all this, the palsied universe lies before us like a leper. And like willful travelers in Lapland who refuse to wear colored and coloring glasses upon their eyes, so the wretched infidel gazes himself blind at the monumental white shroud that wraps all the prospect around him. And of all these things, the albino whale was the symbol. Wonder ye then at the fiery hunt. And so that, uh, particularly the line you know, the colorless all color of atheism, like he's talking about like the whiteness of the whale represents like the absence of meaning uh, or the uh, ultimate like uh, inscrutability or ununderstandableness of the universe. And yeah, because for me, when you talk about Job, that's what that's what it sounds like as well. Like the whale. Yeah. Like there is, yeah, there is that sense in Job that's like, no, 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 there, there is a certain amount of knowledge that is inaccessible that like, you know, uh, especially regarding like, um, why bad things happen to people. It's because it's a, it's a complex, uh, intricate, uh, universe with lots of wheels spinning and, uh, sometimes, uh, whales just bite your leg off. <laughs> And line, <laughs> whale line everywhere. Um, I like I like that. Uh, I also I also feel like uh, just in that talk about light, uh, I keep finding little bits in the book about light and the power of light, and it's impossible to to like dissect the idea of light from the. The fact that the whale itself is like this oil that is used for light. Yeah, that he, yeah. And and there's like so much about uh, the. <laughs> He's just like kind of again. I think like multiple times he like uh, tells you like oh like all these people are breaking their backs so that you and your home in England can sit at night yeah. by a lamp and yeah read this book maybe. 
it's uh the uh and i'm sure this isn't an, an original point but the uh the the whalers reminded me of like the modern day coal miners who were like uh, like oh, it, for it sure, is yeah. itself, like coal specifically within the fossil fuel industry is very much like a dying industry. Um, but it's like uh, huh. this brutal, like hard work that just destroys your body. Um, and yet uh, a common refrain you hear um, from like miners is like, I mean, we've been providing you energy kind of thing like don't you know don't come at us because yeah. this is like an yeah. awful like you, you were in on it too you just didn't have to get your hands dirty um but uh yeah uh tldr job is the uh the best uh book in the bible this is so interesting to me because because you're uh, it reminds uh, heathen, me, like Queequeg. Like that specific... Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, definitely. <laughs> Which also, I wanted to... Uh, I'll, I'll say this first. Uh, when Queequeg describes why God makes the beast, <laughs> he says this fucking awesome line uh, where he says, the God what made shark must be one damn engine. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fucking great. I love that line so much. Because it's like, it's like when you're looking at it that way, there's no great answer that can be had about why bad things happen or a creature like a fucking shark that'll eat. Like, I think they at one point you describes like a shark that's half eaten itself. It's still trying to eat its like own bits and boobs. Yeah. Uh, boobs. Like, <laughs> Dude, I love the taste of boobs. Crazy shit in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, uh, yeah, that's uh, that. That god is one damn engine. <laughs> um, but what I was going to say before is the the quote that you just read, the Job piece, is uh, weirdly similar to uh, the Bhagavad Gita when Ar Arjun uh, oh, okay. is talking to, like, the I think it's Vishnu. Yeah. Who's also mentioned in Moby Dick. Um, and, and Vishnu is like, he tries all these different things. He's like, giving him reasons like oh this is why and this is why and then finally he's like look this is why dude i fucking made everything look at me and then he like shows him like the godhead and, and like in his maw the entire cosmos is being devoured and this fucking crazy and then arjun's like okay well uh that's a good point and i'll do my job it's like oh but it, it's it's a similar invocation the, the way god talks versus vishnu is this the uh the the oppenheimer now i am become death uh, yeah yeah honestly I yeah, think it yeah, is. yeah yeah okay very awesome um <laughs> Get all that's, yeah that's very that's another thing that i very much want to read is the bhagavad gita uh we did like very small amounts in a world literature class that i was in but it Honestly, it just felt like the teacher gave us cliff notes and was like, here's something you should be aware of, but it's not really going to be on the test. Yeah, it's a that's an interesting book, too. I like I feel like it's I don't know the thing that you said about um, about Joe, the, like there's like there's two parts and the second part is like uh, just like poetry. Epic yeah, poetry. like the two composition parts. One's an older piece. One's a yeah newer yeah yeah so like the bhagavad gita was kind of like that where like think as a whole it's a addendum to the larger text of the samsara whatever what i, I, I don't know. know the vedas the vedas yeah Did and I get it right and yes. it entails this problem maybe uh <laughs> and it entails this problem nobody looked that, like, that up we're just gonna world. assume i'm right no, yeah, no, gonna... no, no, smarmy uh, <laughs> corrections in the comments, please. <laughs> this is a fact checked free podcast. Yeah, everything is wrong. Everything that you've heard is wrong. <laughs> but everything that I say um, that is recorded is actually true now. That is how you make truth, is you record a podcast about that's it. That's the world we live in. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I don't know. It's those both exist as like addendum texts where it's like trying to convince people like 
you know, you just gotta you gotta lay your head down and just get get to it. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um Okay, let's see. Well, uh, we should move on. To... I I wanted to uh, add to kind Go of ahead. wrap this back into uh, talks about the industry of whaling and capitalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we kind of got away from that. What this book describes, because I think the like for me the the religious part and the capitalist or like larger picture uh, examination of the whaling industry, they kind of like always it hand in hand especially as he's describing the whale mm-hmm. um so like uh, one of the one of the whole there's like a ch- sequence of chapters that like really hit me where he talks i think it starts with um oh damn it where does it start it starts with him talking about oh there's there's two whales heads on the on the boat they got a sperm whale and then the right they get a right whale, whale yeah. because of of some kind of equilibrium that it'll somehow fetch yeah it. they don't want it to tip over then, to one side right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and uh and so then he goes like into examinations of each of those heads yeah um and so it's this whole section that starts first the sperm whale's head then the right whale's head then the battering ram the Great Heidelberg Ton, which is just such a cool thing that exists. And then it goes into cistern and buckets. So, like, uh, I think the 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 thing that was really interesting to me here is, like, when he describes, first, like, he ridicules throughout the entire book the right whale. The right whale is, like, right. constantly spurned. He's like, it's an inferior whale. Right, right, like, right, let's right. not even talk about it. <laughs> Even though he does, let's give it not a talk about. But uh, except if I can uh, throw some shade at it, <laughs> bitch ass whale. Um. Uh, but like, let's see. F tier whale is what he would rank it. There's just like fun little bits in here. Uh, is it not curious that so vast a being as a whale should see the world through so small an eye and hear the thunder through an oh, ear which yeah. is smaller than a hair's? But if his eyes were broad as the lens of Herschel's great telescope and his ears capacious as the porches of cathedrals, would that make him any longer of sight or sharper of hearing? Not at all. Why then do you try to enlarge your mind, subtilize it? Just like little bits of fun little yeah, <laughs> wisdom. There's also, um, there's also a moment, I don't know if it's in these chapters, but when he's talking about the sperm whales, he's talking about how you can never look a sperm whale like straight on into the oh, eyes. Because yeah. its yeah, head it's is so, so, so massive. Big. Like You're it's just crazy. looking at a wall. Their heads held like a ton of oil, like one ton of oil up to like it's... that much, which is like insane to think about. Um, it's one of the things in the book that like, the, all the parts of his language that I'm like, oh, like that's crazy that somebody can write like that are infinitely overdone by the just the little facts like that about the whale. Like, yeah, and the business of catching one. I'm like, this is just fucking crazy. Yeah, like the these creatures exist first, and that people would decide to hunt them for oil <laughs> is crazy and insane. Very profitable. <laughs> No, but the thing about um, <laughs> like like the thing about um um never looked like the whale straight on. That was another like sort of uh the mystery of the universe, the mystery of God thing. Like you can never see the thing like straight on, or it can never see you yeah. kind of straight on. You can't ever get like the perfect view of it. Yeah, and I think that's in these chapters. It's it's that it's like he keeps talking about it from different perspectives. Like he focuses on the eye, the ear, the fact that it doesn't yeah. have a nose, that it's a giant mass. That he's he like goes in and talks about the Heidelberg ton, which is like all that oil in its head. Yeah, and 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 like and just describing the intense space that it takes up, and then deifying it, telling you like. This thing is as a god among men. You cannot look at it in its entirety. You cannot conceive of it in its entirety. Yeah, it's this great thing. And then it tells you how, in like disgusting detail, how they then destroy that thing. 
it goes into cistern and buckets, whereas like Testigo is like trying to get up and open up the hole and send the bucket in, and then he falls into the head. Yes, that was my favorite. That was <laughs> my the favorite head chapter. Falls off the, when he fell into the, the head and uh Queek has boat? to go in after him and it describes like yeah. you can see him struggling inside the whale's head as he's oh, inside of it. And you're just like, oh my and I thought I think that that's like my favorite part because minor spoiler alerts, but you know, you are over an hour into this podcast. Uh uh, uh Testigo gets saved, actually. I thought he was dead for sure. And I love it when uh, Dude, you can convince me that someone should die, probably ought to die in, you know, will die, and and then no, our our wonderful, beautiful hero, <laughs> hero of the book, Cohog, as uh, one of the one of the ship owners calls him. Uh, I do. I think I have a. Uh, he saves the day. Wait. Oh yeah, this is a good one. Uh, okay. Uh, the quote here at the end of that chapter. Now had Tashtigo perished in that head, it had been a very precious perishing, smothered in the very whitest and daintiest of fragrant spermaceti, coffined, hearsed, and toned in the secret inner chamber and sanctum sanctorum of the whale. Only one sweeter end can readily be recalled, the delicious death of an Ohio honey hunter who, seeking honey in the crotch of a hollow tree, found such exceeding store of it that, leaning too far over, it sucked him in so that he died embalmed. How many think ye have likewise fallen to Plato's honey head and sweetly perished there? <laughs> it's a health to the resolution, likewise the Eliza Swan, a health to the Battle of Montrose and the Diamond Ship of Fame. They wear the trousers of the white, the jackets of the blue, when they return to Peterhead, they'll find that we've been true. So cheer up, my lads, and let your hearts never fail. While the body ship the diamond goes fishing for the whale. Um, did you have anything to say about uh, the, the prairie or the masthead? Yes, the masthead, uh, because for similar reasons, there's like constantly this dichotomy between characters characters who uh think a lot and and characters that don't think too much or like like ahab just like have one thought yeah the single undying thought um and so i just like the the parts where ishmael is talks about himself as a thinker but specifically the masthead um where he talks about you know himself as a thinker and other thinkers who have have uh maybe um spent too much time in thought or lost out on other things because of thought um and so in the masthead he talks about his like first shift on the masthead and uh <laughs> and and how easy it is to just fall into you know quiet contemplation and and dude permanent stop mood entirely paying attention <laughs> i know right and this is like also this stuff like the whole first chapter too where he describes like uh feeling listless and needing to go to sea to fulfill some part of himself so yeah well it's like a rainy november um, <laughs> in his soul yeah <laughs> um but so like in the mass head he says um oh god Beware of enlisting in your vigilant fisheries any lad with a lean brow and hollow eye given to unseasonable meditativeness mm -hmm. and who offers to the ship with the Phaedon instead of Bowditch in his head. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, he... Um, God, uh, I guess he ends that whole chapter by saying... Uh, let's see... Um, I don't even know what this part means. Uh, uh, there is no life in thee now except that rocking life imparted by a gently rolling ship, by her burrowed from the sea, by, oh, borrowed from the sea, by the sea from the inscrutable tides of God. But while this sleep, this dream is on ye, 
move your foot or hand an inch, slip your hold at all, and your identity comes back in horror. Over Discartian vortices you hover, and perhaps at midday in the fairest weather, with one half-throttled shriek, you drop through that transparent air into the summer sea, no more to rise forever. Heed it well, ye pantheists. <laughs> Heed it well, ye pantheists, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's i mean he, when he's talking about like yeah the the descartes he's like talking about like slipping out of like daydreaming there right yeah like yeah coming and like, back to the uh, horror over... of his world <laughs> yeah and i like i i i'm interested by these things that he keeps mentioning in relation to himself as a thinker and as other thinkers around him that like mm-hmm. The 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 whale itself cannot be thought through. It can't be understood. Every attempt he makes is kind of wanting. Yeah. Like he mentions almost every time that he's like, I can't like show you a whale. You have to see a real live whale. I can't do it justice. I don't even understand it. Like he's always quick to point this out. Yeah. And but it's also like impossible not to talk about it. It's impossible not to at least try. Yeah. Um, which we could say and, is like uh, Ishmael's own sort of uh, monomaniacal uh, cause. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, I, I kind of see uh, Ahab and Ishmael. Ishmael is like a uh, um, leg tearing off moment is is the, the sinking of the Pequod. Yeah. And he goes on the rest of his life just contemplating the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... We haven't talked much about Ahab yet. Um, I feel like that's crazy. I I know. What did you like? What do you think of Ahab? Uh, uh, Dude, smash every or pass? word he says is so cool. Oh, smash for okay. sure. I mean, he'd probably smash me, <laughs> but uh, I just love the way he talks. It's like uh, uh, the lighthouse watching the lighthouse. I just love oh, that movie. kind of crazy. Speak shark. I think that's what uh, Pelik says. You can't speak shark. <laughs> well, Captain Ahab like only speaks shark. He's a fucking shark. If there ever was one. And he's um, so I he he reminds me of uh, I'm gonna make a very you know simple movie reference comparison. He reminds he reminds me of like these great sort of supporting actor roles like. Uh, I was thinking particularly of like Hannibal Lecter, but also uh, from Silence of the Lambs. But uh, also, like a character actor. Like... Well, like he's like he's kind of in a lot of ways like Hannibal Lecter or like Anton Chigurh from No Country for Old Men. Like where yeah. they're these like okay, terrifying, yeah. huge personalities in the movie. But when you like actually look at their screen time, it's like, oh, they were on screen for 12 minutes. It's a two hour movie. They were on screen for 12 minutes. And it takes us like a hundred pages to even right. see Ahab for the first time, and then he comes out with his. Uh, how do they describe? Like on that first, uh, the first whale they see, he like comes out of his cabin with just like four random oh, yeah, Chinese guys or whatever. I can't remember if they're <laughs> actually Chinese, but like, it's like, oh yeah, I've just got. I'm just keeping some dudes in here. Yeah, and Fadala. <laughs> Yeah, it struck me that I thought there was going to be more Ahab screen time, and it's like, no, it's it's pretty limited overall, um, and it does it like really efficiently, which I think is the correct call. Yeah, I think Ahab is kind of like Moby Dick in that way. Like, you don't see much of Moby Dick; you hear about it from other people. Everybody, everybody's just waiting to tell you their story about Moby Dick <laughs> or Ahab. <laughs> Yeah, 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 like I heard, <laughs> and and yet you see them, and they're just kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, uh, like one of the sort of parallels that I was thinking about Ahab in real life is how, um, and this is definitely not an original point, but um, how like much of a demagogue he is, and how mm. there's like tons of people like um, Starbuck for sure. Uh, like straight up thinks he's kind of like dangerous and uh, bad to be around. 
but he's also like too much of a Almost coward. Like to, from the get go. Yeah, yeah. From like the get go, and it, but he's like too much of a coward to like put a stop to it or you know try and mutiny or or whatever. Even though he's putting everyone's lives at risk and he's you know doing things against like the owner's wishes. Mm-hmm. And it's a very uh, uh, one might say it's a a, a a very American thing to do. Certainly, at least <laughs> when looking at these times. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I think American, but also like I don't know. I feel like we're seeing a lot of, a lot of fascist-looking people rising in this day and age. Yeah, <laughs> all over the world. Like, yeah, like fascism is not unique to American, but this is the great American novel. Luke, this that we no, can only talk no, it about. Is, it is. And I American things. <laughs> That's true. Only America. Uh, I am in America right now as well. Um, so I think I the 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 thing that makes it so interesting to me is that this. I mean, not that a book is ever gonna save the world or whatever, but like this was okay. written so long ago, and <laughs> maybe. I haven't seen the end of the world yet, so I can't judge. Uh, but uh, but like this book was written a long time ago. It's it's received its acclaim eventually, and and now it's like the great American novel, which is impressive for any book to be. Um, but like, how is it held in such high esteem if? I feel like none of the things that this book describes as problems or potential uh, prophecies of our nation have been solved in any way or in any major way. I guess, I guess, uh, you know, slavery ended and civil rights happened. We have a bit more of a, a progressive world, but like, sounds like job all the same to issues. me, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> But I feel like the the Ahabs of the world are still Ahabbing it up right now, and the world is gonna get dragged under to meet Davy Jones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure, but how? I, I yeah, we we jokingly talked about uh, books saving the world. Like books aren't going to present, you know, or prevent. Excuse me. Well, books aren't going to actually like prevent you know, bad things from happening. Right? Oh, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, like, I don't know how it would. Right. But I don't know. The, it, it's a quaint idea I would like to believe in that, you know, you could write a book, and, you know, like if, if, uh, uh, if only the great Gatsby uh, had uh, prevented people from <laughs> wildly speculating in the stock market or something. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> You know, it's 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 a lens through which maybe we can under like art is a lens through which we can understand things uh, kind of after the fact. Um, but we don't necessarily use it as a uh, uh, a compass to avoid future things. I don't know. Plus, uh, as you said mm. uh, early on, uh, th- this is an intimidating, hard book with lots of big words. No, true, and that people apparently are doing bad press about almost everywhere I've gone. <laughs> like, it took me so long to even hear a good thing about what we did, <laughs> which is crazy. It's the greatest American novel. It, 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 is it the greatest American novel to your mind? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, come I on. I don't know. It you gotta have hot takes on this. I would say it didn't move me as much as uh, other books that hit me, you know, in their time. But I am constantly flawed by it, or uh, not flawed. Uh, like uh, um, I'm constantly overawed, in awe of it. Yeah, overawed by it. Uh, it's it. It kind of reminds me of the Pale King, honestly. Like I feel like the Pale King would have been the more updated version of this book. My goodness, or some some similar, because it's like a similar premise of like looking you you got your character that kind of goes into the industry and and dissects it from every sure every from every angle yeah point. 
Yeah, six. and examines all the characters they're in and all the city. Interesting. So I don't know. Like there, there's other things that have done similar, and I think have been inspired by this book. Um, but I don't know that I've ever read a book that's this complete. Like I finished it and was like, "What the fuck? Like this is." This has got everything this in is it. The real deal, except for women. This has got <laughs> everything in it, except women. <laughs> uh, which maybe is its most American aspect. Now, you know what I really um, thought about when I read this book, and even as I was reading it, I was like, "Oh, no wonder everybody compares like Cormac McCarthy to Herman Melville." <laughs> like, I totally get it. I don't know how much oh, McCarthy yeah, you've read. I could see that. Um, but like not a ton, but I've read uh, No Country, No Country for Old Men, and something else. Um, oh, the road. Yeah, this book like like completely reminded me of uh of like Blood Meridian, um, which it's often again mm. not an original point, but it's interesting how they're both like um. Uh, they they both first off they take place in about the same time. Like I know Blood Meridian takes place in like eighteen mm-hmm. late eighteen forties, early eighteen fifties. Um, is Blood Meridian about that one? Is about uh the Glanton gang. So the kid is the uh the main character, and he uh signs up to basically he's like a 14 year old kid and he signs up to be a scalp hunter with uh these other oh uh with with just this like gang of white people and they go out and you know oftentimes they're not like actually um because they're contracted by like little um i think both mexican and american kind of border towns Mm -hmm. to go kill indians and bring back their scalps and then they'll get paid for their scalps there's also this like terrifying there's literally a character in it called the judge and he is like a large like seven foot albino man (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) um it's it's very clear that it's in dialogue with uh it but this whole okay one of the really cool things that i discovered so uh blood meridian was actually based on a true story um, if you ever have the time, look up, uh, Samuel Chamberlain's, uh, my confession, I think. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's something it's, it's, I think it's called my confession. And he basically tells about, <sighs> cause like a lot of times they wouldn't go out and kill like, uh, you know, actual Indian, if they couldn't find any Indians, they, they, they'd find, uh, they'd find anybody and they'd yeah. take those scalps. They, all they needed is the scalps. All they needed yeah. was scalps. <laughs> Um, and so, um, it's a book of like, you know, great violence, um, and, and, you know, obviously takes place within like westward expansion and a time of, you know, uh, great historical violence. Uh, but they're both, but that book was, um, inspired by true events. And then apparently this book was too, not just like the author's like actual true events of his life. Yeah. Not, not just melville's like actual stuff that happened mm-hmm. to him but there was uh a whale ship accident it was called uh, it's by a guy named owen chase and he writes about it in something called like uh the tragedy of like the whale ship the essex or something i don't know if it's tragedy but like uh, there's yeah. a story about uh this guy that um goes on uh a whaling mission and he uh like the whale he's one of in one of the harpooner boats and like the whale like kind of uh shoves his head like stoves this stoves his little you know harpoon boat and they're like oh god we got to get back mm-hmm. to the main ship and so they like throw a bunch of the ship. <laughs> they, they they throw a bunch of like uh coats to the stove hole and they make it back and they're like oh we can fix it and just as they're like kind of about to fix it, the Owen Chase like looks down and this sperm whale like jumps out and breaks a hole into the ship. And within, you know, a couple minutes or whatever, the ship 
uh, breaks down <laughs> and it's gone. Um, and so they use like the last, anyway, most of the narrative is actually about how they survive the next nine months after the, or not next nine months, oh, geez, three months, three nine months, months, 90 days. Oh, even, um, and, but <laughs> it takes them three months. They're like 2,500 miles off the coast of Chile and it takes them three months yeah. to, to like get back. And so that was apparently sort of the, the kernel of truth, uh, uh the jumping off point that. Uh, Melville used, and I find it really interesting that these two sort of great American novels, one obviously Blood Meridian trying to, you know, very much be in in dialogue with uh, the other, uh, are both based off of these true events. Well, now I have to read Blood Meridian too. You really do. Damn it. Everybody does. <laughs> uh, um, and he just do, like, died, Luke. Regret- did he? Oh. He uh, died a couple months ago. Damn it. Sorry. Cormac. Cormac. Similar. Herman Cormac. No, Cormac McCarthy is a much cooler name than Herman Melville. That, <laughs> but Cormac by itself? Uh, Cormac? Yeah, it means king, I'm pretty sure. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, but <laughs> here's the thing. Uh, he, I forget what his original name was. That was not his birth name. That is like literally an author's name. (laughs) But, um, authors are tricky. No, I, I, uh, that's interesting to me. I, I, uh, I don't know how you write a book like this, except with some kind of real thing that happened. Yeah. But, uh, but it's very funny how, like, but it, real life events can be full of these like very of this yeah sy- symbolic like juice symbolic storytelling and just like you know it, it it's like the orcas that we talked to at the <laughs> beginning it's like nature attacks back sometimes <laughs> yeah 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 it, it's it's a wild world <laughs> Ooh, baby, baby, it's a wild uh, world. <laughs> it's hard to get by. Also, wanted to say, yeah, you're, uh, you're I, I don't know why singing. I didn't say you're this. You're interrupting earlier. my singing. I'm oh, sorry. Unbelievable. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry cats. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead with whatever your point is. Oh, um, uh, yeah. My point does is <laughs> does not deserve to be said. Uh, I just wanted to uh, shout out Chile, where I am. And how Moby Dick was a Chilean whale. Shout out Chile. <laughs> you gotta get uh, you gotta uh, get him like a ceremonial like soccer jersey or something from your uh <laughs> and, and award it to Moby Dick. I, He's probably still out there, right? I think so, and I think he was always there. Like uh big old scary a whale. Like the Greenland whales can live to be up to like 400 years old. Which is like insane. <laughs> Don't even to tell me about, about the Greenland whale. Dude. Dude. I spit on right whale. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, just too bad that they're like the oldest the, the, the oldest heads one might say. It'll be bright both day and night when the green little lads come home With a ship that's full of oil, my lads, and money to their name They'll make the cradles for to rock and the blankets for to tear And every lass in Peterhead sing hush my dear So cheer up, my lads, let your hearts never fail While the bonny ship, the diamond, goes fishing for the whale Uh, Luke, did the ending of this book shock you? I think the thing that shocked me the most is that he was so... It's like, I mean, he goes on and on and on. The whole book isn't necessarily concise. But the ending is, like, Ahab dies in a paragraph. Mm -hmm. And the whole ship explodes in, like, a few more paragraphs. And And then the epilogue is just him saying... Yeah, and I I survived on the coffin, <laughs> and then he's like, "Peace out." 
I was uh, I was kind of amazed by that. I I thought it was gonna be just based on his other stuff and his other parts of writing. It's like he'd have another two chapters to debrief. And be like, oh, and then I never had it land. Now he's just like, that's the story. Boom. Nope. That's that's the Which story. Well I, well, I wondered with the uh, yeah, I wondered kind of uh. Uh, one, I wondered how much like people would, if people would, uh, get like the reference to the sinking of the whale ship Essex, um, because mm-hmm. like what happens in, like the crazy stuff that happens in that book isn't actually that the whale like breaks their ship; it's right. that like they have to resort to cannibalism <laughs> at a certain point in order to survive. <laughs> Shit, <gotcha. laughs> and so i wonder like i have no idea how how much that would be sort of cognizant in the reader's mind but um i think we can you know this is a tale about the high seas i think we can maybe uh take it with a little bit of grain of salt and sea water um he could be an unreliable narrator and uh, I, I guess, you know, we're coming up on two hours here. What I really want to know, Luke, is uh, did Ishmael lie to us and actually eat Queequeg? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Seems like the only answer can be I yes. Don't, I don't. <laughs> I'm being provocative. If, I'm if, being provocative. If so, then uh, Queequeg was like having a bad day or something. I don't think Ish could take Queequeg. I, Ish didn't ever sound like that cool or strong. Like he's a great yeah, writer. Yeah, but he's the think he's, he's the narrator. He talks about stuff. He talks about true. the inner workings true. of Ahab's mind, which he has no access to. True. True. Uh, he talks about like scenes that he wasn't present for. You know, like stuff. In, <laughs> All the yeah. Time, yeah. Stubbs thoughts, Stubbs thoughts, <laughs> Stubster. <laughs> I yeah, I mean, I like to think he didn't because I like the bromance, the eternal bromance of it. But uh, I think it would also be uh, a fun uh, character arc for both Queequeg and well, it's a, Ishmael. Yeah, it it was one of those like, uh, oh, I wonder if he's hinting at this kind of obliquely like. That there was that you know because of the source material maybe there's some cannibalism but also um, you know per our earlier discussion like is he hinting at some some explicit homosexuality that he's just not going to write because it's not it's not it it it, it, it it's not kosher for the audience at the time. <laughs> yeah, there there's so many things like that too that I don't know where he's like holding punches or. Or even if like I'm not understanding the language correctly, because I'm not of that time. He also just seems to be playing with language a lot anyway. So like, oh, it's very playful. Playing with, it. playing with language, playing with truth. And I think there's there's pieces like that. Like uh, the book that he presents you is in its own way like a whale. It's unknowable. Like he doesn't. The answers aren't always there. Even when he like says one thing, he means like three things at once. He's like making an illusion, tying it to an another illusion, then laughing at all of it. Like also, oh yeah, like he constantly like something will happen, and then he'll like show you, oh, what did Ahab think about it? What did Stubb think about it? What did Fl- uh? Fl- I never remember his name. Uh, Fl- Fl- Fleet. Fl- 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 what? Like he, um, Who are you the other, about? other, the last of the, like the, the third mate. Uh, Who's the third mate? Heads. Flask. 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 He like gives you everybody's thoughts on the thing. Yeah. And, and like, first of all, Ishmael clearly didn't know any of their thoughts. Second of all, what does it mean that he's like doing all these pluralistic things that are like, what is the truth? There is no truth. It's a. It's like the the whole fucking thing about the doubloon. Where you're like everybody has their own take on the doubloon, right? And 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 then uh, I think Pip says like the craziest things. Like, dude, uh, R. Talks R. About how they're all looking at the doubloon. Yeah, Pip was Pip was a real one. Pip was a real one. Poor Pip. Just Pip. I feel like I was Pip. 
like if I was in this situation, I was Pip all the way. Like maybe instead of a tambourine, I had like a guitar. But <laughs> Pip all the way. Um, I'm gonna die a Pip. Hey, at least you'll Before die uh, singing sea, sea shanties. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I can do that. Okay. Except apparently not, because I don't remember. Anything. So let's. Uh, <laughs> I I say we wrap this up by uh and i am gonna put you on the spot uh about a um what what on a scale of five luke what would you give this book and you can obviously use decimal points to whatever degree you want uh five being like the best book ever written yeah five being like i you know one of your I don't know. Five being like an all-time favorite. It doesn't have to be singularly the greatest book ever written. Yeah, honestly, I would give it a five. I love this book. Like, Is it a book you would reread? I really like his book. I would. In fact, uh, in doing this, I've already touched on like chapters that I had forgotten about and still need to reread because I don't quite know what happened. Um, and there's some stuff that I'm like, uh, you know, maybe I don't want to end up like the uh, undergrad students I met that were monomaniacally, monomaniacally entranced yeah. by it. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I do think it's a fucking sick book, and I am just as a as a writer, I think I could learn a lot from it of how to uh, attach big ideas without being too, I don't know. Lame. Okay, I have some fun trivia for you. Wait, no, wait. What's your answer? Oh, uh, I mean, I definitely use a decimal point. I think it's in the like, in like the the. Uh, I'll say four point six. Um, which is still uh like uh, like it's not quite. I don't know. I have to sit with it and see if it's going to be like an all-time favorite. I'm uh it it definitely like it really makes me want to read a lot more of Melville, especially like his early uh that too, yeah. Um like I want to read yeah, cuz apparently the early stuff that he wrote like Type E that was like you know, uh, a sort of bestseller at the time. It was like that was what he was known for. In this book mm. was like uh you know, um <laughs> this was a failure this was a commercial failure um and it was one of the last the the last book he wrote i think is called the confidence man and that's actually uh i've heard good things about that i really want to read that um because i think uh even more than this book that book will probably have lots to say about america as it is today <laughs> um but yeah, I would go like with a 4.6. I really do appreciate because, uh, you know, a, a lot of like long books, um, you know, the 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 chapters are are too long. In this chat, this book, it's like oh, I love the chapters. You get a hundred in like thirty five chapters, I think, and some of them are just a couple paragraphs, and it's nice and it's wonderful. And yeah, like. He he knew very well how to like lead the reader through these weird ideas that he has. Yeah, even like the way he spaces out all the whale knowledge because he knows he's, you're not gonna sit through five chapters in a row just talking about whale right. pieces parts. Okay, well that's so yeah. he like gives you oh and here's a story about a guy that almost died. So that's uh <laughs> so that's my trivia corner here. Uh okay, so there's 135 <laughs> chapters. How many of the chapters are devoted to whales or just cetology? Cetology specifically, I want to say like 20 maybe? Okay. 15 to 20? The answer is 42. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know it, it, see? But I think that's it. Like, it's um... not as. Uh, uh, <laughs> As dry and in sort of overpowering with like tediousness as sometimes maybe it's made out to be. Like sometimes uh, one of the common criticisms I feel like about this book is that like talks about whales too much, talks about like whale parts too much. And it's like, look, Luke here, 
loves the book, thought there were 20, which is a pretty, that's a lot of chapters to talk about a whale, but it's actually twice as many. So book goes by twice as fast <laughs> as you think. <laughs> it's true. In that. There's also a whole bunch of things like uh, where he's talking about just the way other things work or like he'll go off about some like the the line or something where he's talking about a specific piece of equipment. Yeah, he'll talk about like how different parts of the ship work. Um, yeah. But and I by the way, that 42 answer uh, one answer the life universe and everything Two. Uh, oh shit! That is a uh, half afternoon at research that I just took on its face. I did not count them uh, personally. <laughs> oh, Again, shit. this is a fact check well, free it's real, though. You podcast, said it, so. uh, and yeah. we have created our facts here just now. Hell yeah! Uh, Luke, would you like to play us some outro music? Uh, bing bong boop go da pop boop but oh this is friends oh this is the friends <laughs> song oh no oh shit oh da 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 do that doo doo oh god there once was a whale that was hunted by men come on give me up a sea thing. shanty um, um luke thanks for slob gallian th- thanks for joining me on this voyage in which we uh uh, talked rather freewheelingly about uh, uh, <laughs> Moby Richard, written by uh, one of the worst named authors, I think we can agree, uh, uh, in our canon. Uh, would you like to, do you have any pluggables that you would like to plug? I don't. I, I it could be a friend's have, pluggable. I have things online, my Instagram, where I usually, my Right on my my Instagram, where I usually post things, uh, where I usually don't post things, but have the potential to post things, uh, is at Dust Puppy Blues. Dust Puppy Blues on Instagram. I don't even think I that's, follow that man. It. Oh really? See? Well, you've got. I got. I got. I got to get on my plugs. Clearly. Uh, thank you to everyone for listening, and watching. Hopefully, the image that I selected was. Beautiful. I think I'm going to try and do uh, some kind of dumb AI art thing, uh, but we'll see. Uh, please uh, like and subscribe and comment down below and uh, send in your uh, submissions for uh, the sea shanty that we should use as an outro for uh, this song <laughs> or for this podcast. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll totally, we'll, it, it, it'll, we are, we are watching the submission box closely. What is the submission box? I don't know. I don't know. And I believe it. Hold on. Okay. Bye everyone. <laughs>